Um, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for coming, and it's a great pleasure to welcome Professor David Theo Goldberg to Uhuru. Um, he's here for a couple of days, and I'll mention some of the other things that are going to be happening later on in the week, well, actually today, after tomorrow, and the next day. Um, but for now, he's, I think, the, the, the details of what he's going to be talking about are on here, but I think it's just as a couple of comments worth making. I think it's, it's, it's rare, but it's also very wonderful that we are able to have someone of his caliber here at Uhuru and here in Grandstown. Um, he's literally a global figure when it comes to questions of race in particular, but he's, but he's involved in various other things, some of which I think we'll be talking about tonight or coming up, will be coming up tonight. Um, he'll be talking for about 45 minutes, after which we will have time for some questions and comments. Um, but that note over to you and welcome. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be back here. I was reminded that I was nearly 10 years younger <laughs> when I was last here. I, I had something called hair at that time, <laughs> which has been a while since I've looked in the mirror. So see myself in this test, but it's really a, a pleasure to be back and uh, I've been in South Africa much to that Tuesday a week exactly. Um, so both at UWC and at WITS over the last couple of days. And it's been pretty simple at the time, so uh, pleasure to be back. Um, you know, in the US uh, we are sometimes required to express trigger warnings when things are sort of um, a little offensive, it's not a lot offensive, and people might get kind of put up by them. There are going to be some, uh, I mean, I'm talking about the logic of the post racial and, uh, and, uh, and racism in the structure of the post racial. So the images are going to be quite stark. Uh, I'll try not to sort of leave the, the worst up there for any length of time, but just be warned. Um, trigger warnings are really bad. Um, so the uh, you know this talk is coming out of the book uh, Are We All Post Racial Yet? And uh, the question is purposely provocative, um, in the sense that it seems as an empirical question uh, obvious to answer in the negative. Right? I mean, if uh, anybody thinks otherwise. Um, Donald Trump needs his, needs his or their head exactly. Um, uh, so I think that's really the wrong question to be asking. Uh, the driving question for me is not whether we are or aren't, and then to come with empirical data, some of which will follow uh, in due course, but um, to ask what kind of racial work the post racial is doing. Right. So that for me is the driving question, you know, um, between a kind of assertive post-raciality and an aspirational post-raciality. An assertive post-raciality is over oh, there, Obama got elected, the party is over, etc., etc., etc. You know, we no longer have to talk about race, racisms. Uh, as I'll come to sort of formulate this logic in, in a bit, uh, you know, racism um, as a state phenomenon is pretty much over. Um, let's get on with life, right? Um, on the one hand, and a kind of what well, I might call it sort of aspirational and more affirming kind of an aspirational form of futurity where racism really is no longer a driving condition of our social arrangements, right? And, um, and so I want to sort of just try to pause this out a, a, a little bit uh, in, in due course. I mean, I can talk a bit bi autobiographically about how the book came to be written and so on, but I think that if anybody's interested, I can come back to that. It was actually out of the JWTC, University of California Humanities Research Institute, Two week seminar on archives of the non racial. I sort of went into that as a co organizer, thinking about these things, having written bits and pieces. And after you spend you know, two 
intensive weeks on a bus with 60 people, including the likes of Angela Davis and Gus and Hodge and so on. Yeah, you, I wrote the book on a plane going home. In fact, <laughs> I mean, I'm not exaggerating too much. Um, so a series of key distinctions to get us going. The distinction between, on the one hand, structural racism um, and experiential racism. So this, you might say, is a form of experiential racism. Experiential racism is a racism that individuals or groups of individuals face as a result of their going about their life, you know, their, 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 their living in a more extreme basis, and you know, earning a living in this case, in this case, maybe a very good living, um, you know, even if in a truncated sense, and. Um, <clears throat> And coming up against you know, older forms of racism sort of staring you, and not only older forms, new forms of racism, as, as a condition of one's particular experience in that more or less that moment in time. Structural racism, of course, has to do with the social and state structures that enable or make possible or extend um, uh, racism such as it is, such as it is, has existed. And, to do it in a less obvious and visible way, but to do it a, a, across all of, or more or less all of social conditions. Right? And of course, structural racism, as I've already hinted in the language I'm using, structural racism makes the, the very structure, structuring conditions of social and, um, and formal political life and so on, already order the possibility of the extension of experiential racism, and, race, and experiential racism, of course, reinforces the less obvious, maybe um, underlying structures uh, uh, that racially order lives in uh, racial societies, in what are called, also called racial states, which is to say every modern state. I mean, my argument in the racial state is, right, um, is that all states become modern by, in a sense, taking on the technologies of the racial in some way or another. Right? Uh, and from pretty much the late 15th, beginning of the 16th century onwards. And of course it becomes thicker and thicker into the 19th century when uh, apartheid is a version of that and so forth. So we can come back to that if you are uh, interested. Um, so racisms are always expressions of power. I mean so so you've got um, you've got experiential racism and then you've got you know, the kind of structural conditions of where people live, under what conditions they live, you know, not as a consequence of particular individuated choices that do or don't make, but because they're, they're positioned into that set of possibilities or impossibilities in their more extended life conditions. Um, so racisms are always expressions of power, right? Both experiential and structural. They structure the social conditions of power, and you know, an, an expression of racism is always expressed from a particular um, uh, existential, you might say, uh, condition of power in relation to another, right? Uh, of, of, of relative uh, sorts of consideration, um, and they both express or reinforce uh, existing power power relations, maybe even begin to transform them depending on, on the nature of the, exper uh, uh, of the experience uh, to lesser or uh, greater degrees. Um, and so um, I want to then also draw the distinction between private and public racism, so uh, uh, around or that distinction will underpin a good deal of what I argue about the structural course as we come to see. So the uh, private racisms, right, are the racisms that take place not simply not in the public sphere. I mean, you know, that, that distinction between private and pub public itself is uh, contingent, right? I mean, where that line gets drawn in a particular sort of way. Uh, but the private has to do with the particular choices that individuals make in relation to others. Uh, and, and public racism is not just racism in the public square, but what I'm, what I'm using as a more formalistic sort of conception of the public as representative of 
state structure and the uh, forms of um, um, policy making uh, that the state comes to stand for. Um, and then uh, just a further set of distinctions as a form of threat theory over here. Um, the, the, the distinction between the kinds of racisms that exist, I mean, Gus and Heisch, uh, the Lebanese Australian anthropologist, who, uh, a really interesting thinker, distinguishes between exploitative and eliminative racisms. Exploitative racisms are those racisms that engage others in order to put them, say, to work uh, for the purposes of self-aggrandment, not the self-aggrandizement of the worker, but the self-aggrandizement of the person who's putting the other person to work, which might be more or less coercive slavery, for example. Uh, but, uh, you know, might be less obviously coercive as in, you know, relations between capital and labor you know, and so on and so forth. And eliminative racisms are on one level, you know, exactly what they sound like, getting rid of people. Um, uh, and getting rid of people by, by killing them. Uh, but eliminative racisms are also a condition of removal. I mean, think of the apartheid condition of forced removal, think of, you know, uh, the Israeli state kind of fluctuates between exterminationist um, forms of elimination and removal forms of elimination, right? I mean, as a way of purging uh, the state in order to claim the whole of extended, uh, as they put it, Judeo Samaria, sort of for the sake of the Israeli, the you know, Jewish Israeli state. So there you see the way in which these things interact with each other. But there's a third form of racism I want to insist on betwixt and between the two, if you want to put it in those terms, and that is dismissive racism. Racism that, you know, in a, I mean, obviously they interact with the exploitative and the uh, and the uh, eliminative, uh, but it's a, you know, it, it, it's it's conceptually a different form of racism, right? A dismissive racism where the the being of the person is being dismissed through hu humiliation, through demeaning, through degradation, that happens in sort of you know usually in experiential sense of conditions. One interacts with the person, and then, you know, all of a sudden, the person's cussing one out in ra in racist, what we would characterize as racist terms, and so on. Um, attacks on dignity, on the dignity of the person, of the being of, of, of the person. And uh, Philomena Esser, to whom I'm somewhat connected, is um, uh, characterizes this as entitlement racism, right? Um, uh, a way in which one entitles oneself with a standing to speak in that way in relation to others as a form of dismissal, as a form of degradation or derogation and so on and so forth. Um, and then lastly, in terms of distinction making, uh, the distinction between anti-racialisms and anti-racisms. Right? I think a, a key important distinction over here Anti-racialism is against the invocation of the concept of race to characterize and structure people in various sorts of ways. And anti-racisms are against the very things that exploit, eliminate, uh, dismiss uh, people, whether it's structures or uh, conditions of experience and so on and so forth. That, uh, and perhaps we'll come back to this uh, further in, in due course as well. Now, I want to say that um, it's worthwhile to think of post-raciality, now to come to this, to begin to come to the heart of the talk, to think about post-raciality in terms uh, of its, uh, its emergence out of the legacy of forms of racial condition, experience, and structure over, you know, a post-abolition 100, 150 year experience. So what do I mean by that? So you know, if you think in terms of the US context, but you can um, uh, you know, structure this with some nuance in relation to a whole range of other states, including the history of South Africa. Um, uh, the notion of assimilation, 
sort of begins to take hold at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. And assimilation is a condition that, that or the claim that those who are who are who have historically been racially characterized as different from the privileged here you know, white European kinds of people, right, should um, uh, should become like the white guy in culture and uh, expression and uh, uh, and aspiration uh, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, so that assimilation means the giving up of what you left behind in order to become like this elevated sort of being uh, represented by white Europeans. Um, that in order to be a civilized person, I mean, you see it in uh, in Matthew Arnold, you see it in a range of sort of expressions at the end of the 19th and into the beginning of the 20th century, whether in Europe or America or, or, uh, and, and uh, uh, former colonies, France, the assimilation condition uh, in, in, in relation to its, its colonies and so on and so forth. And that gives way to, so, you know, this is a more modern expression of it. But it's, it begins to get at something of the, right, uh, uh, the living in Detroit, Arab American, right, got to be a fan of the Detroit Pistons, the basketball team in the city. So you put on the shirt, you put on the, you know, the, the baseball cap backwards, uh, uh, even while you're wearing a chador, right? So, kind of, so I mean, there's, there's a way in which this doesn't quite get it because you still got the chador. You're supposed to give that up too, right, in order to be American in some sense, or white American in some ways, but it begins to get at sort of the, the, the sense of the translation into assimilated uh, life. And that begins to give way, um, it really starts at the, at, you know, in, in a way at the end of the 19th century, very, very longly, certainly in the US, you see it in the 1880s in its first expression in, um, in Plessy v. Ferguson in 1896, uh, segregation case in Louisiana that reached the Supreme Court. Of, um, later it comes to be characterized as, as uh, color blindness, but, uh, but integration, right? So integration differs from assimilation in saying that in your private life you can be whatever, you know, you can wear your chador. It doesn't matter, you can you know, go about however you want in, in private, but public square kinds of undertakings, everybody should be equal. Everybody should look equal, everybody should dress more or less alike, and so on and so forth, right? But, you know, if you want to have your private ethno-racial um, celebration at home for your, for your holidays, and so that's fine, right? The state will, you know, uh, it will protect the domain of privacy, uh, in, in some sense. And so, that begins to give way very explicitly, I mean, you see it first in Justice Taney's um, uh, minority report in, 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 Louis, in, in the Louisiana case, in Cassie B. Ferguson, where, you know, kind of blindness, I mean, his, his characterization is really interesting. He says, you know, whites should have no fear from blacks if we declare color blindness, because whites are already, I mean, this is his language, right? Whites are already so elevated in culture and education that in the, in the open competition that follows, whites will always win because they're really so far ahead. And it's quite explicit about it. And it takes 50 years before it sort of begins to take hold as a driving condition of the state. I mean, interestingly enough. But there's a book by Margaret Halsey in the 1940s called Colorblind. Uh, right? So it begins to sort of take a grip of the, of, 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 of the culture of the place. And, you know, integration sort of emerges in a way out of that as integrated schooling, ground the board in the U.S. But you see it in in uh, uh, in other places and so on, right? So you see it in, in, in this kind of expression, where the the aspiration is being <laughs> colorblind is precisely because those who are really ahead will remain ahead, right? Um, uh, in, in, you know, even if it's hard for them. And then this gives way, you know, so you're already in the 50s and 60s with, with you know, robust color commitments to color blindness uh, in, in the sense of things. And through the 60s into the beginning of the 1970s, really, it gives way to multiculturalism, right? So you get emerging the dominant sort of view, whether in, you know, the early Trudeau, Pierre Trudeau's, Trudeau's Canada, 
uh, in all kinds of European countries, you know, Britain, case in point, Australia, uh, and so on. This commitment to multiculturalism, which is you know, giving up the, the aspirations towards sort of, uh, at least explicitly, towards a kind of self-elevation at the expense of others. But, you know, ethno-racially, everybody should kind of mix together and, and uh, you know, continue to be protected in their self-expression of their ethno-racial background, uh, and, and so on and so forth. And I want to suggest that post-raciality is an emergence as a negation of, a negative response to, what are perceived as the excesses of multiculturalism in the way in which I'm characterizing it. So you begin to get this, right? So light culture, for those of you who know any German, I mean literally translated would be leading culture, it's dominant culture. We want to re-elevate dominant culture in the European theater, right? Germany, Austria, etc., etc., France, and so on in the face of this perceived invasion of otherness, where we feel like we're losing our own culture over here, right? And, you know, we're crossing our multiculturalism. I'll give you some more explicit expressions of this um, in, in, in a minute. I mean, so this notion of toleration that emerged in the 1970s, you know, we should all tolerate each other. I mean, toleration is always, as the sort of signals, is always expressed from a position of power. The tolerated never say, I want to be tolerated, right? I mean, yeah, I want to be respected, right? I want to be treated equally. I don't want to be tolerated by you. And uh, the, the powerful are always saying, oh, we'll, we'll tolerate those who are different from us. Right? But gradually, more or less, right? Uh, in, in, in some sense. So you begin to see how multiculturalism has failed. The death of multiculturalism, David Cameron, um, what's in name, Merkel, uh, and others, right, in, in the name of a kind of, I mean, Cameron explicitly, in the name of a muscular liberalism, and in the very term he uses, right? We should go back to muscular liberalism, you know, by, by pushing back the sort of wave of the multicultural that has come to mark us over the last two years. It's like about a 25-year period, and this is like a year and a half ago. I have a photograph up here of, of Merkel and Cameron greeting each other, and it looks like they're kissing, right? I mean, it's quite classic, sort of, uh, you know, under this sort of sign of, uh, you know, multiculturalism is dead, right? So it's a sort of, um, um, this contractual handshake. In, in. But you see it in these expressions. Multiculturalism, multiculturalism is genocide. Genocide of whom? Of those who really belong here, right? Of the really English, of the really French, of the really German, of the really German Austrians, and so on and so forth. Or, I mean, the ambiguity of murdering multiculturalism, right? <laughs> multiculturalism is murdering us, we should kind of get rid of it. You see some in that ambiguity and so on. So I'm arguing that post-raciality, this commitment to the post-racial, emerges out of this sort of longer tradition and needs to be read in, in relation um, to that. So let's just go back to the sort of empirical claims for a second. You know, and this is very quick. I mean, there's all kinds of data you can point to. But look at these comparative data of black-white unemployment, not, not to reduce everything to black-whiteness. I mean, that's probably blackness-whiteness, that's probably a mistake too. But but the, you know, the unemployment figures, and these are, are quite contemporary, right? I and mean, they're pretty telling. So in South Africa, black unemployment is something like 28%, white unemployment is 7%. So all, for all the fetching about uh, affirmative action, I mean, you just have to cite these figures. Right? Um, the US has always been, no matter what the unemployment rate in the US is, Black unemployment, African American unemployment is always double white unemployment. Always. It doesn't matter, you know, if it goes up to 10% for whites, it's 20% for black. And, and, and more like 50% for uh, black youth in cities like Detroit, Chicago, and so on and so forth. In Britain, again, you know, almost triple. Uh, France, 
6% difference, but still significant. And, and there they come in with them um, and so on and so forth. In Canada, it's double, uh, double as well. So that's, you know, it's not like it's located to a, a specific uh, nation state, right? And incarceration rates, as the flip side of that, or the, or the conjoint of that, are also telling, right? The incarceration rate of black South Africans is 20 times that of white South Africans. The US is six times black or white, right? There's now two, two million plus people in prison in the US. Huge incarceration, rate, right? And uh, something like 55% are black, another 20% are Latino and Indian, and 23 or something percent are white, right? And the population is 70% white, right? 69% white, now dropping. Britain, 10%. Uh, a black, uh, the black incarceration rate is 10%, 2.8% of the population. Canada, five times black and First Nations that are white. France, the incarceration population is 70% Muslim. Ouch, right? I mean, so you begin to see the sort of racial divides in different formations of the racial uh, 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 across these formations. <coughs> So now I'm going, to, I'm, I'm, I'm going to show some not pretty pictures, so bear with me just for a moment. In Sweden, I mean this is a, a form of private experiential racism, but done in the name of the Minister of Culture, right, at an art gallery opening. So she wasn't representing the state, she just happened to be there, but gloating over a cake that was made out of a, black, a naked black woman's body. And, you know, I mean, pretty awful. France and, um, and Italy, the first two black ministers in each of those respective governments being subjected to these kinds of characterizations repeatedly, right? Um, and then you get, you know, the, the way in which, and, and I think, you know, these are quite telling. I mean, this is a Michael Brown killing as among a slew of uh, police killings. And what post-raciality does, it exonerates the state in the name of individuated responsibility. Right? So who's responsible here, if anything or anybody is responsible at all, it's individual policemen. It's not the state or the state policies which has purged itself largely of explicit racial designation and characterization. Right? So that you know, the person who gets kind of taken to task, leaving the state untouched and leaving policy largely untouched. I mean, you know, there are all kinds of characterization were of the Ferguson police force. 53 people in the, in the, in the Ferguson police force in a 60% black um, urban area, right? And three of the policemen in the 53 numbered police force were black. So the way in which things get ordered around these racial conceptions become uh, quite deep. And then you'll know this from the uh, University of the Free State, right, a lecturer kicking, again, experiential. I mean, so, so the logic at play here is the logic not that the institution has done anything racist. It turns out that this guy was a lecturer, right? So in a sense, representing the university, so you, 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 you discipline him, or the institution disciplines him, and leaves the institution right, free and wiping its hands, sort of institutionally, other than wringing its hands about needing more education, or needing more dialogue, or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So I'll, I'll, I'll come now to the, um, to the, to the logics of all of this. Um, so post-raciality, as I've said, is a pushback against multiculturalism, the death of multiculturalism, the denial that race any longer is relevant socially, um, and the denial of that denial, right, when, 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 when the racially expressing are called on their, on their racism. But, oh no, no, I had no intention, right? Not me. Uh, you're just reading it. You know, it's your fault. And I'll, I'll come to give a more sort of analytic language for this uh, in the moment. It's your fault for reading race into what was not intended 
uh, or understood or conceived or uh, wanted as a, a, a racist form of expression. And I, I want to say that this represents a very condition of the logic of the expression. Um, so, first and foremost, in terms of this logic, is the state purging itself, as I've said, of explicit racial expression in its policy making and its legal determinations and so on. It's not that it doesn't resort sometimes to you know, laws outlawing racial discrimination and so on, but its own language is, you know, uh, we're not going to distinguish between people in terms of race, right? So, uh, you know, uh, uh, affirmative action notwithstanding, I mean, that's a complication, we'll come, can come back to that. Uh, but for the most part, you know, the laws apply to everybody equally, and should apply to everybody equally. So that's the first move. The second move is then to protect robust free expression in the private sphere. And what does that mean? That means that one is free to express oneself in racist ways, and it differs from state to state. And one is protected by the state in expressing oneself in those terms. In the name of free expression. You see this in Denmark and Holland and France to some extent. <coughs> Germany is a little more complicated. You certainly see it in some ways in the US. In the state of California about a decade ago, there was a, an attempt to introduce a law that was voted on by everybody. And eventually it was voted down. It was called the Racial Privacy Act. Not the, the, the designation of the terms. The Racial Privacy Act was the undertaking to outlaw the invocation of race for any purpose whatsoever, but for two exceptions. So you couldn't, you couldn't use race to collect data on, um, on housing discrimination. You couldn't use race, already you couldn't do it, but it got extended. You couldn't use race uh, for affirmative action so you couldn't hire, uh, uh, hire on the basis of race, you couldn't admit to colleges on the basis of race, and so on and so forth. No use of race, but the two exceptions were kind of interesting. One was collecting data on racially identified illness, like Tay-Sachs disease and so on. They you know, themselves questionable in terms of racial configuration, if you read people like uh, Rua Benjamin and uh, uh, Alain Nelson and so on and so forth. Um, and the other was, I mean, you can guess it, was the invocation of race for criminal justice purposes. So racial profiling was okay to, for use by the police on, on account of suspicion, or as I say, for voting down. But notice, notice the terms of the law. It was in the name of a civil, it was explicitly called a civil rights initiative. The law was a racial privacy act. We're going to, out, we're going to outlaw the use of race by any state agency, including state universities. And we're going to privatize the possibility of racial, and by extension racist expression, by putting a kind of wall around free expression so that you can express it. You can, you can discriminate if you have a private apartment and you want to put up a sign that says no blacks, or no Jews or no Muslim, and you would be protected by the state from doing that as long as you weren't using state resources in order to do so. So you see this double move. On the one hand, the state purging itself of the language, and on the other hand, the state uh, protecting the privatization of the very expression that it takes itself to be beyond and over. And you probably see elements of it kind of you know, seeping into the social fabric um, over here. Um, it also involves, uh, uh, just to go back to that distinct, those <coughs> distinctions between assimilation, integration, multiculturalism, and, and post-raciality. Um, assimilation and multiculturalism are experiential forms of the racial. They largely privilege the experiential over 